morning. I'm showing 9 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mike DeLucluse, President of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Uh, Lessman's own Dan Wisey is going to cover uh, when there are so many flow technologies, how do you get the most accurate flow measurement in changing process conditions? Today, Dan's going to introduce you to the latest smart multivariable transmitters for the best process flow measurement in difficult applications, especially in gas and steam flow. In this 45-minute webinar, we'll, we will uh, review the use of differential pressure to measure mass flow. You'll understand the difference between volumetric and mass flow. We'll cover the issues of measuring flow in gas and steam applications and why multivariable measurement works. Dan's been involved in all facets of process instrumentation since 1978, from sales and commissioning to service and support. He's a longtime member of ISA and has been with Lessman since 1988. Dan is the primary contributor to our process solutions blog and routinely travels to Lessman customers to help them solve their instrumentation problems and help them get the most of the technologies they use. In Dan's words, He's the guy who reads the manual that nobody else does. In Lessman's customer's words, he's the trainer to call if you want to cut to the so what of instrumentation. We will be muting the phone lines. If you have a question, please type it into the built-in tool that's in GoToWebinar, and we'll make sure that we get them answered. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Mike. As uh, Mike just said, we're going to look at accurate DP flow measurement and changing process conditions today. And to start off, we'll just do a quick review of differential pressure flow measurement. I'm just going to call it DP through the rest of this. But it's been around for ages. As you can tell, there's a 1940s illustration on the left there. And it looks very antiquated because it is by today's standards. But it was still making a DP flow measurement. And there's an orifice plate down here in the pipe. There's fluid flowing through that. We're getting a high pressure on this side and a low pressure on that side. Over here we see uh, more of a European style where they do pipe taps, but it's the same thing. There's an orifice plate here, high side, low side, goes up to a modern transmitter. And then the graphical illustration up here shows a cross section of the orifice plate with the flow going from left to right. And then a manometer on the bottom showing the, the uh, difference in pressure using a water manometer. So what is differential pressure flow measurement? Well, it's basically a volumetric flow measurement for gases and liquids. And by definition, there's some kind of primary flow element that creates the pressure drop in the pipe. And there's a half dozen common commercial varieties of that. The common ones are orifice plates, uh, averaging pitot tubes and venturis. And then there's several high-tech versions of that. Fluidix HHR takes the venturi and and gooses it up, and the same thing with Accelibar, they use a pitot tube and they goose it up to give you more response in, in a smaller package, as it were. The flow meter is actually a differential pressure transmitter, or what we're going to see as a multivariable transmitter, which reads the pressure drop, and it has the option of converting that nonlinear pressure drop to a linear flow rate by doing doing a square root extraction on it, but that's optional. Some people do it in the transmitter, other people do it in the receiver device. So it transmits either the differential pressure or the linearized 0 to 100% flow rate signal. It's 4 to 20 milliamps, and there's typically a local display on the, on the unit also, so you can get a readout in either pressure or flow rate. So the signal comes into the receiver, and it interprets that 4 to milliamp signal as a volumetric flow. And if the transmitter hasn't done the square root, then the receiver does it there. That's very, it's common in either situation. And this volumetric flow measurement is then used as a input for a control loop. Very prominent in oil, gas, large pipes, uh, steam, and gas flow. And there's a guy by the name of Bernoulli who did the math 100 years ago to prove that all this stuff works. It's actually more than 100 years, but we can call it that. So, there's an issue when you do volumetric measurement. And volumetric is absolutely great for retail. When you go to the store, you want to buy a gallon of milk or a two-liter bottle of Coke or a pint of ice cream, right? And essentially, you want to know how many glasses will that two-liter bottle of Coke fill. 
you know, and it can be either a half liter, 6.9 ounces. It's all volumetric. But the problem is when you go into the process world, the process world, world deals with chemistry or heat. And that chemical processing, to deal with the chemistry part, it wants to use mass units or BTU for heat. Volumetric just doesn't work because volumetric measurements do not take into account density. And it's just critically important in the process industries that, this, that, that you're dealing with mass or BTU and not the volume part of it. Because the mass measurement actually reports how many molecules or moles, if you took chemistry, are actually coming through. And we get that by measuring in typically kilograms or pounds. But the problem is if you have too many or too few moles of stuff or molecules, you're either going to waste it or the reaction isn't going to work right or you're throwing it away. So there's some problem when you don't use mass. And it's important to understand, too, that the that when you have steam, that the heat in steam is actually carried by the water molecules. And that heat transfer is a function of the mass of that steam flow, not particularly the volume, because the volume can have different densities depending on what the, what the pressure is. So the density of all those little water molecules in a steam pipe is really related because of the closed volume. It's related to what the pressure is. You get the wrong number of molecules, you get the wrong amount of heat, and you get the wrong BTU input into the process. So and the same thing happens with gases. The density varies with pressure and with temperature. So here's the issue. Gas is compressible, as is steam, and the liquids are not. So we're not really looking at this kind of technology for liquids because it doesn't have the same issue of compressibility. And the density varies of these materials, varies with temperature and pressure. When you go to design a DP flow measurement, you design it to what they call design conditions. And design conditions are used to size the flow element and also to tell the instrumentation what that, what those, what it correlates the design of that flow element to what it's going to read back. So it uses as design conditions operating temperature, pressure, density, and viscosity. And those are operating points. In other words, you, I'm, you can say, I'm going to operate it at 160 degrees F at a pressure of 50 PSI. And those are your design conditions. The end result of all that is that you get a flow rate at a given DP for those design conditions, but only for those design conditions. And I gave you an example there. It says 2,000 cubic feet per minute at 100 inches of water column. And it'll be actually quite accurate as long as all those operating conditions hold true, you will actually get 2,000 cubic feet per minute at 100 inches of water column drop. But if the temperature goes up or the pressure goes down, you'll still get a reading, but it will be an error from the design conditions. Because any deviation from design operating conditions produces an error. You're getting a reported DP that's measuring a flow, but it's measuring a flow that's more or less dense than what was accounted for in the design conditions. So here's a chart that actually shows you what happens when the temperature deviates from the design condition. The design condition down here was stated as 60 degrees F. So right at 60 degrees F right here, we see we have 0% error on our vertical scale. As we move off of that, if we move up 10 degrees, we see that we have a approximately a 2.5% error for a plus 10 degree error. Uh, change from design conditions. And if we move down to 50, we got about a 2% negative error in the other direction. Same thing happens when you deviate with pressure. And here you have multiple scales because with pressure, it depends upon what your operating pressure is. If you got a half PSI change, that's going to have more effect on a 2 PSI uh, static pressure than it does on a 100 PSI static pressure, just because it's a smaller or greater percentage of that. So the, the, at the lower pressure, we'll take the 2 PSI line here. You can see that the error is much greater here with the yellow dots than it is at the 125 PSI. But the point is, you still get substantial percentage of error as you move a couple PSI off of the design conditions. So we can compensate for this, for this deviation from design conditions. As it turns out, 
it's just my observation that it's more the rule than the exception that operating conditions in the end do not hold up to be the same as design conditions. Regulators uh, either have droop in them because of the load on them or the setting just isn't what one expects. Temperature changes. So in the end, you're living with volumetric measurements that have some sort of built-in error to them because the operating conditions do not meet the design conditions. So compensating for the working static pressure and for the fluid temperature can eliminate this. Now when you do this, you do pressure compensation has to be an absolute pressure referencing absolute zero because all of these calculations are based upon uh, referencing absolute measurements, absolute uh, pressure and temperature. With temperature, it's sort of easy because you measure ordinary temperature and you just uh, allow for a, a conversion to Kelvin. But with the absolute pressure, you actually have to measure it down to absolute pressure with a uh, cell that does so. So whereas flow measurement and DP is volumetric, once you do this compensation for temperature and pressure, you now have an inferred mass flow, not volumetric. So now you're getting into the mass world of pounds and kilograms rather than liters or ounces. Historically, this was done with a flow computer. And a flow computer makes three measurements. It has the differential pressure, measures the static line pressure in absolute units, measures the fluid temperature, and then with those three, it calculates the mass flow. It's an inferred mass flow measurement. And the, you can see this in the units because with DP, it should be stated in liters per minute or cubic feet per minute. And with steam, it's always given in pounds per minute or pounds per hour here in the U.S., although that's an assigned value. It isn't really. It's a volumetric measurement, but they give it false units because they've done it historically. A flow computer that uses temperature and pressure compensation provides standardized flow units. So instead of getting CFM, which is cubic feet per minute, you go to standardized or standard cubic feet per minute, which is corrected to standard temperature and pressure. The flow computer then, with that inferred mass flow measurement, can give you true pounds per hour or kilograms per minute. And the ideal thing about this with steam is that by doing this temperature and pressure compensation, you actually can now account for steam's superheat, which volumetric flow can't deal with at all. So here's the historic form of the mass or the flow computer. You have three separate transmitters, static line pressure, differential, and process temperature. And you take all three of those signals into a box, does the calculation, and you get a mass flow out of it. With a multivariable transmitter, you now have a single unit that does the same thing as all three of these individual devices. It has a sensing element on here that it wires up and goes in there, but it's basically one unit doing all that that's right there in the process instead of what we saw before here, which was the, uh, which was the uh, flow computer. Honeywell has their second generation. They call it SMV for smart multivariable, and they call it the 800. And it uses this thermocoupler RTD in a thermal well to give us the temperature measurement. And by the way, this is not a transmitter. You don't have the added cost of the transmitter. It's just the sensor feeding into the uh, multivariable transmitter. There's a digital display on it, so you get a digital readout of the mass flow and its units. Inside, it's got this embedded absolute pressure transmitter to correct for pressure error. And it also has an internal database that has the viscosity and density data for over 100 fluids. So as you go through a temperature range, it can compensate for viscosity and density. And the end result is you get this mass flow, inferred mass flow measurement out of it that is, is a compensated measurement. It looks like a DP transmitter. You know, it's got the same body, same head. You can see the components that go in there. Unless I actually have to read the part number to tell the difference between them because they, they use literally, they interchange parts between them. But it has a more powerful processor and the multivariable that does the uh, compensation calculations. 
There's also a heart breakout box that's available. We have the multivariable on the side over here, and it sends the 4 to 20 signal, which is also heart, to this thing called a breakout box. And the breakout box interprets all four of the signals, the uh, actual differential pressure measurement, absolute pressure, temperature, and the calculated mass flow, and it breaks them out as four individual analog signals that go into the, into the uh, computing system. There are some people that just don't believe historically that, you know, one box can replace a flow computer, so they want all four signals to back it up. This is not a necessary thing. It's there if you wanted to do it. Uh, I think 95% of our customers do not use this. They just take the mass flow out, use the mass flow. But it's there if you want it. So to sum up for why you use a multivariable, well, it's a flow computer in a single transmitter body. You get all three measurements, you get the compensation. The output is what people really need, which is the inferred mass flow value in pounds or kilograms. It minimizes the process intrusions because instead of three separate transmitters out there with three separate process intrusions, you only have the DP and the temperature probe going into the process. There's no separate flow computer. Who benefits from all this? Well, the people that do steam flow do because now you're getting actual mass units of pounds per hour, not in a volumetric measurement that you call pounds per hour and has that uh, whatever error is involved because you haven't held the design conditions. If you're doing gas flow, same thing. As soon as you vary, uh, deviate from design conditions, there's an error. You get rid of that when you do the mass flow compensation. This really fits for high temperatures because you can put the element, the primary flow element, in the pipe. You can isolate the transmitter from that high temperature with the impulse lines. And the other, uh, most of the other technologies just can't take the high temperature of 600, 700, 800 degrees out. The DP can. That's why DP still survives. Uh, DP also has very high pressure ratings for the bodies that other devices just can't tolerate. And in large line sizes, yes, a Coriolis meter does give you a mass flow measurement, but they don't even make 24-inch Coriolis meters. They do make 24-inch Venturis keto tubes, and orifice plates that will fit in the line and will give you this kind of measurement. So when a process needs a mass measurement, which is pounds or kilograms per time unit, that's when you want to use a mass flow measurement. Here's the classic example. When we started out, or the, the title of this thing is Accurate DP Flow Measurement and Changing Process Conditions. And this is the prime example of where that actually made a difference. In this case, they were ratioing two different gas flows to create a blended gas flow. They had a 20-year-old control scheme on there that was using DP measurements to create the, the blended result. And they were claiming that the, you know, the 20-year-old control scheme just needed updating because they were constantly tweaking this thing. They'd run over once an hour, literally, and tweak it to adjust it. Well, it turns out that when we went down to look at it, it was unheated buildings, uninsulated gas piping. It went from inside to outside to inside to outside. So the temperatures were constantly changing in the gas line. And this was literally hour to hour, day to day, and season to season that you were dealing with these temperature changes. And we also found out that the load changes on the regulator that was supplying one of these lines was changing because there was another process that was sharing this gas supply. So as the other process took more or less, the, the droop in the regulator would change the supply to the process that we were concerned with. And it turns out the process actually needed to get a, the blended mass flow that they needed, they needed mass flow measurements because the volumetric flow measurements were not accounting for the varying gas densities due to the changing temperatures and the changing supply pressures from the, from the droop in the regulator. And again, we, can't, we were involved in this because they were continually tweaking this thing manually. They had a downline analyzer that would compute what the end result of the blending was. So they'd get a readout from that, and they'd run over, and they'd tweak the process to try and get it a little bit better. The solution in all this was they put in two multivariable transmitters to actually get a true mass flow measurement 
of what they were feeding in to the blend. Once they had mass flow going into it, they could get a mass flow out of it. The, it was a, the classic mass flow situation there. So that just sums it up, folks, and I think we're at the end here for questions. Dan, I don't have any questions yet, so we'll, we'll start to wrap it up a little bit here, and while we're wrapping it up, uh, we'll see if some questions come in. Uh, I'm going to take the presentation back then mm -hmm. and show my screen. I, oops. I keep my uh, question box open. All right. Um, Dan, thank you very much for your presentation. If you have any specific application questions, feel free to give us a call at 809 Lessman or 800-953-7626. If you don't know your account manager, feel free to ask for myself, Mike DeLaCluse, or Dan Wisey. Uh, you can also reach me on uh, email at mikeD at lessman.com. Uh, if you want to know more about the technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. You can see some of the ways that you can do that on the screen. Dan's blog is very active, has tons of great tips. All of our webinars are posted both on our website and on our Lessman Instrument Co. YouTube channel. So you can uh, share them with coworkers or review them if you'd like at a later date. Uh, if if there are any topics that you'd like us to cover in our webinars, please send me an email with the subject. We have access to lots of product and process specialists, so we can typically find the right person for the application that you're looking for us to cover. Uh, next month, our webinar topic will be presented by United Electric Control's Bruce Albert, and we're going to talk about the best practices in process protection and safety shutdown. United Electric has some very unique technologies for uh, what used to be pressure switches, and uh, they've really modernized it. And, and uh, if you use pressure switches for safety shutdown anywhere in your plant, you should find that very interesting. That's going to be on Thursday, April 27th at 9 a.m. Uh, at this point, I still don't have any questions. Uh, if, again, if you do have questions, feel free to call myself or Dan. We'll be happy to help you out. Uh, at this point, I think we'll conclude our presentation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all very much for attending.